Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath Services. Today, we're going to ask the question, why is Jesus the only one qualified to die for the sins of the world? And of course, it's a whole lot different than what the Orthodox Christianity believe. Let's go to one of the famous verses that they always read, and let's see how they cannot possibly progress beyond this. And that's contained right in the same chapter. So John 3, and let's pick it up here in verse 16. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. Now, if you have a King James, that reads, should not perish, and should have eternal life. But it's not written in that sense, because may is in the Greek meaning that there are conditions applied to it. So how do we know what conditions are applied? And who applies them? <laughs> you know, it's one thing, if a man says do this, is it not another thing if God says do this? Totally, yes indeed. So let's read on. For God sent not his Son into the world that he might judge the world. Final judgment's coming later. But he did have to make certain judgments along the way during his ministry as well. But that the world might be saved through him. Okay. Now then, the next one is really quite an important section, and that runs all the way to verse 21. Now, verse 18, the one who believes in him is not judged. What do you do when you believe in Jesus? What is it you're believing in him for? Well, quite a few things. First of all, Forgiveness is sin. Second, through the Father, hopefully, eternal life. But right there, the Protestants leave you immediately because they're all going to heaven. Okay? But the one who does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the judgment. Now notice, it lays it out clearly. See, because if all you needed was John 3.16, why do you need the rest of the Bible? Verse 19. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Who is the light of the world? Jesus Christ. But men love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. They don't want them exposed, and that's doubly true in Washington, D.C. Now, verse 20. For everyone who practices evil, hates the light. Okay. Everyone who lives in sin, they hate Christ. And does not come to the light so that his works may be exposed. No, he wants to live his life the way he's living it, okay. Now notice here's the key, verse 21, right here. 
And this is why we have the rest of the Bible. See? But the one who practices the truth comes to the light. Now, how do you come to the light? Will you come to the light through prayer, through study of God's word? Okay. Because his word is light. The spirit of God is light. God the Father is light. So this is what you're coming to. Every day when you come to God. Every Sabbath when you come to services. So that his works may be manifested, that they have been accomplished by the power of God. So this means that you do what you do, spiritually speaking, because of the Spirit of God. And as we know, with upcoming days of unleavened bread, it's God's Spirit and Word in you that alerts you to when there's a sin, that alerts you when you do something that is not right. Now, people in the world don't have that. Okay. Let's come to Hebrews 10. Now, the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book. And a lot of people don't believe that Paul wrote it. But when you look at the style of the writing and you look at the end where he says, Timothy is with me, it has to be Paul who wrote it. Okay. And he explained very clearly what it is that we need to have our sins forgiven. And it is by Jesus Christ. And so why only Christ? Here in chapter 10, we're told that the blood of animals, can, it's impossible to do away with sin. So the truth of the matter of the temple is this. When they came and offered a sin offering, they were forgiven to the temple. Not in heaven above. But they were forgiven. But it didn't take it away from them internally to change them. See? So sacrifice of an animal will not take away sin. What about if it's another human being? We'll talk about that again a little later. If someone died for you to cover your sins, could his death cover anybody else's sin? No, it would be a one-on-one. -on -one. So it has to be something greater. Something greater. Okay? And that greater is God. And we know how Christ came. He divested himself of his glory and was impregnated into the womb of the Virgin Mary, born as a baby, grew up as a human being, Okay, and then on the Passover day when he died, he offered his life for the sins of the whole world. Okay, but he had to be made human first. Okay, so this is what we find. Verse 4, Hebrews 10, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. For this reason, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but you have prepared a body for me so that he could come and be the sin offering. Come down here to verse 9. Then he said, Lo, I come to do your will. Now notice how that ties in with what we read in John 3.16. I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first covenant in order that he may establish the second covenant. 
by whose will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So how could Jesus' sacrifice be once for all? And then you also have to consider all who died in the past, they didn't know anything about Jesus, and all who are going to die in the future, and how many today have died in Christ from the time of Christ till now? Very few. So how is that done? Okay. Well, we're told in, we know this one, so we won't turn there. John 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, that's how we have the sacrifice of God, yet human, and we will see, yet perfect in everything, so that our sins can be forgiven. Okay. So let's see how that works. Let's ask the question, how did sin come into the world? Well, we're not going back to Genesis because we've been there recently. But let's come to Romans 5. How did sin come into the world? Romans 5 and verse 6. For when we were without strength at the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. Not just sinners, ungodly. Okay. Appointed time. What was that appointed time? Passover day, 30 AD. For rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, although perhaps someone might have the courage even to die for a good man. But God commends his own love to us. Now remember where we started, God so loved the world? Okay, here's another aspect of it right here. For God commends his own love to us because when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for us, before we were even conceived. Much more, therefore, having been justified now by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his own Son, much more then, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we who, we also boast in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. Okay. Then he tells us how sin entered. Therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by means of sin, death. And in this way, death passed into all mankind, and it is for this reason that all have sinned. Now that means this. The judgment of Adam and Eve changed their nature. And then they received the wages of sin is death. They were going to die. Now, they lived 900 years before they died. I often wonder about year 750 and looking at each other and saying, well, you know, what if we're going to die or not? <laughs> After 750 years. Okay. And what else? Their nature was changed to be hostile toward the laws of God. 
Okay? We read that in Romans 8. For to be carnally minded, Romans 8 and verse 6, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the contrast we're up against today. Okay? Because the carnal mind is enmity, that's the same word as enemy, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So when they chose to go against what God said, and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the judgment was against the serpent, the judgment was against the woman, the judgment was against the man, and the judgment came upon Christ who prophesied that he would be the coming sacrifice in the future to solve the problem. But because God gives free moral agency and doesn't want robots, and he's given us minds so we can choose, so we can think, we also have emotions, and so that God can draw us to him and we can repent. Okay, let's come here to, we won't turn there, but that's in John 1, 35. John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, remember what he said? Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin. Not plural, singular plural. The sin. And that sin is in the whole world. So he takes away the sin of the world. Okay? Because that all comes down to all human beings through all time from Adam and Eve clear to the very end. Okay? Christ had to come and be born, live a perfect life, give his life as a sacrifice. Okay? So there are a lot of things connected with this. Okay. So as the creator, then his life would be worth everybody else's lives together. Right? Okay. Okay. Now, let's come to John, the 10th chapter. Let's talk about the sacrifice of Christ. And let's pick it up in verse 11. Because Jesus willingly came. And we know that he had an agreement with God the Father and Jesus Christ. So that he would be resurrected from the dead after three days. Okay, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, the sheep are all of us that God calls. Okay? But the one who is an hireling and who is not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf seizes the sheep and scatters them. And that's what's happened in Christianity down through time. Now the hireling flees because he's a hireling and has no concern for the sheep. But notice the difference with Christ. And this has to be the difference with all of the true servants of God as well in serving the brethren. I am the good shepherd, and I know those who are mine, and I am known of those who are mine. It says in the beginning here, we hear the voice of Christ. And we hear the voice of Christ whenever the true word of God is spoken correctly. Because it's the word of God, as I've said, 
in writing. Verse 16, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring those also, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock, one shepherd. On account of this, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might receive it back. Verse 18, very important. No one takes it from me. And Jesus did not commit suicide. He laid down his life. Others killed him. But I lay it down of myself. I have authority to lay it down and authority to receive it back again. This commandment I received from my Father. Okay. And we know other places where this was all planned before time, before the ages of time, and Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, and all of those fit together. Now then, let's look at why Jesus and Jesus alone can be our Savior. None other. Now today we know of two or three saying they are the Christ. Okay? First reason. Number one, Jesus was creator. He created all things and nothing came into being except through him. Number two, he was divinely begotten as a human being. Had to be. Had to be God. Had to be human. That's why we're told in 1 Timothy 3.16 that God was manifested in the flesh. Okay. And that's what we find for number three. He was God manifested in the flesh. Number four, he always did the will of God. Okay? Even when the crucifixion was coming upon him. Let's come here to Luke 22. Let's see that. Luke 22. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, he went out there after the Passover, after instituting the new covenant, and the disciples went with him, and Judas was on the way, getting the, the mob, the soldiers, to come and arrest him. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and was praying. Okay. Verse 40, Luke 22. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he withdrew them from them about a stone's throw, and falling on his knees, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing to take away this cup from me, dash. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done always did the will of God. Even here. Notice what it was upon him. Okay. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Why? Because in the flesh, he was weak. And here's a great temptation. And being in agony, he prayed earnestly, and his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Okay. Then he chastised, chastised them for sleeping. Okay. Always did the will of God. Let's see another one there in John, the 12th chapter. Okay. 
John 12. There are other places as well, but these two will be sufficient. Verse 44. John 12, verse 44. Then Jesus called out and said, The one who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. And remember, he came to reveal the Father. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. But if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words, speaking the will of God, doing the will of God, has one who judges him, the word which I have spoken, that shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken from myself, but the Father who sent me gave me commandment himself what I should say and what I should speak. So he always did the will of the Father. I know that his commandment is eternal life, verse 50. Therefore, whatever I speak, I speak exactly as the Father has told me. Okay? John 5. Okay? Let's pick it up in verse 30. John 5 and verse 30. And this is also important because Jesus had to rely on the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit at all times, because he could not sin once. Okay? So listen to this. Verse 30. I have no power to do anything of myself, but as I hear, which tells us what? He and the Father were in constant communication. But as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And that's really the key in the whole thing for us, too. Okay? Okay. Then he talks about John the Baptist, said he was a burning light. Now, verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works that the Father gave me to complete. Notice how he was completely reliant on the Father for everything, see? The very works that I am doing themselves bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice nor seen his shape at any time. Okay. Then he says, you don't have the love of God in you and so forth. Now John 3. Let's look at that. John 3, let's pick it up in verse 31. He also tells them who he is. He tells them from where he came. He tells them about the Father. Okay. He who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth is earthy and speaks of the earth. He who comes down from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, this is what he testifies, but no one receives his testimony. Just a few do. The one who received his testimony has set his seal that God is true, for whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Okay? And God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. Okay. 
So there we have it. He did the will of the Father, always. Okay? Number five. He never sinned. Okay? Now, just give yourself a little test. Okay? Just think on this one time. Because this is what we need to overcome. Have you ever had a day where you haven't had an evil thought? Either yours or entered into your mind because you were watching television. Okay? Or heard someone speak. Okay. He never sinned. Okay? So let's let's look at that. Let's come to the book of Hebrews again. Hebrews, the second chapter. I just wonder. How much the Protestants actually believe, except reading John 3.16 and asking for money. Okay. Here it tells us about Christ being of God. So let's come here to chapter 2, and let's pick it up here. In verse 6. And also the whole life of Christ is wrapped up in the purpose of all of mankind. Is it not? Yes, indeed. Verse 6, chapter 2, book of Hebrews. But in a certain place one fully testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? That's referring to Psalm, the eighth chapter. Okay. You have made him a little lower than the angels. And in the Greek, this is angelos. But originally in the Hebrew, in uh, the eighth Psalm, it is Elohim. You have made him a little lower than Elohim. A little lower than God. Okay. You did crown him with glory and honor, and you did set him over the works of your hands. You did put all things in subjection under his feet, and in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that was not subjected to him. But now we do not yet see all things under him. And that's because the plan of God is way beyond our human existence. Now notice, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor on account of suffering, the death. His particular one singular death. In order that by the grace of God, he himself might taste death for everyone. That is, so they can be resurrected out of the grave. Okay. Remember what Jesus said. He said, if you believe in him, you will not taste of death forever. Okay. Now that tells you, you're going to die. But not forever. And there could be no resurrection unless Christ was perfect. And this is why he had to come and do what he did. Verse 10, because it is fitting for him for whom all things were created and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons unto glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, what were the first words of Jesus when he was raised up on that cross? Remember the first words? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, think of all of the evil and all of the hatred and all of the things that were going through their minds when they came after Jesus and had him crucified. 
But I think behind the scenes, or let's put it this way, over the whole city of Jerusalem, there was a great battle going on between Satan and the demons and the angels of God. See? Now we'll see a reference to that a little later. Verse 11, for both he who is sanctifying and those who are being sanctified. Now sanctified means made holy. We are being made holy by the Holy Spirit of God, by the Word of God, by walking in the way of God. These things make us holy through the power of God. Okay. All of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now think about that. You know, we're living in a time right now that's getting pretty desperate. And it's pretty easy to get discouraged about how bad and evil things are going. And I don't think we have ever comprehended how bad and sinful different civilizations have been before our time. But I think we're going to get a taste of it here pretty quick. Okay. And I think we better be a whole lot stronger. In fact, I know we better be because cancel culture is going to come here because those who hate God hate everything about what he is, what Christ stands for, and the word of God. And in the midst of that, we must be strong and we must have the Spirit of God. And we must be against these things. Okay? Have to be. Call them brethren. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise to you. Now, I often think that's going to happen on the sea of glass. Okay? It's going to have all the resurrected saints on the sea of glass. Throne of God's going to be right there. We'll see it. it. Says there in chapter 15, there was the temple of God. It opened up, right? Okay. There's the Father. Don't you think the Father wants to see his children? And he'll be right there at the head of it and say, Father, behold your children. Now that's going to be a fantastic day. See? And this is what we need to keep on our minds with the difficult days coming upon us. Okay. Verse 13. And again, I will be trusting in him. And again, see, where you have again and again and again and again, that's Paul writing. You can find that in Romans 15 as well. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me, therefore, since the children are partakers of flesh and blood, in like manner, he took part in the same in order that through death, now here's another thing his death will accomplish. He might annul him who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now the King James says destroy, but it means annul. Make it as if it never were. Verse 15 that he might deliver those who were subject to bondage all through their lives by fear of death. For surely he is not taking upon himself to help the angels, but he is taking upon himself to help the seed of Abraham. And a lot of people think, well, that means the Jews and the ten tribes of Israel. No, 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 no. We are the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, right? Okay. For this reason, it is obligatory for him to be made like his brethren in everything that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God in order to make propitiation for the sins of the people because he himself has suffered Having been tempted in like manner, he is 
able to help those who are being tempted. So that's quite a thing, what Jesus did. So let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll be back in 20.